In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took wine and gave it to the king. I'd not been sad in his presence before. And so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king, If it pleases the king and your ser- that, uh, if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can be rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set aside. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have a letter to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I'll occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. By night I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down, and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. Because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burnt with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be a disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. (coughs) But when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Amen and God will bless the reading of his word. Now I'm just going to show you a few slides so um, and I thought this was a really good slide. I saw this on the internet and I pinched it. I think that's what we're going to call our series Hand Me Another Brick because as we, as we go along we're going to have bricks. Remember I told you I'm going to get some shoe boxes and uh, we'll work on that. Okay next one please. Okay so here we have um, the distance he had to travel. So you can see Susan on the far right hand side that's where Nehemiah was. Actually, that's the same place that Esther was. Do you remember? Uh-huh. Um, okay, so over in Susa, and to travel to Jerusalem, you work it with that scale, it's about 800 miles. So, you know, when he says, I went to Jerusalem and I was there three days, you know. Actually, the three days, one, he wasn't being lazy, he was probably knackered and he wanted to sleep, okay. But um, 800 miles, and if, you, if you're generous and say they were making 20 miles a day, which they probably wouldn't, certainly with um, all the equipment, so they were probably making about 10, day, 10 miles a day, if we're generous, it's 15 possibly. But if you were doing, so you're talking about how many days is that? That's um, 40, it's probably about 80 days to get there. It's a long time, isn't it, to get there, you know? So they've taken a long time to get there, and you can see now why he needed letter letters for the governors of Trans-Euphrates, all that region. You imagine the area they're passing through. And so when they would go to these governors, then they would promise them safe travel. And they'd probably give them an escort through it. Um, interesting, um, I was, I've been reading a book about a man who walked across Afghanistan. And that's one of the things he did was exactly the same. He went to the governor of the region that he was going to go to. 
who then gave him letters and he was given an escort to travel part way and every time he went to a place he had to present his letters and this was the old-fashioned way of doing things okay so you can see it's a long long distance and I don't think any of us have ever um, traveled on horseback for 800 miles you'd be pretty sad or sore okay can I have the next one here okay so when he arrives I know it's a, it looks technical it's really not if you look at the thick line that's that's the sort of area Jerusalem took okay that's the sort of area there were no walls, it was all rubble at the time, okay? And down the bottom at number one, by the jackal well, called the side arm, okay, that's around where they were probably camping, okay? That's where they reckon, anyway. And overnight, you can see, went from one, um, number two, just by the dung gate there, so if I read that, so by night I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examined the walls of Jerusalem and broke it down, and then he said he moved towards the fountain gate, where you can see that bit further up, Okay, and then, um, then I moved towards the fountain gate in the king's pool and there was not enough room, um, so I went to the valley gate by night and, and examined the wall. So he'd only actually been able to survey that part because it was so un impassable. What they'd done, you see, Jerusalem had been a center of God's people. And of course, before the, before the exodus, or the, um, before they, they took, the, the city was sacked. It was, it was recognised as an important buffer, you see, between Egypt and the rest of the Middle East. So basically, what they did, when they went in to destroy it, they said, right, we're going to completely destroy it, and they did. And they knocked all the walls down, so you couldn't move. And the people, when they went back, actually didn't live in the walls either, because it was just so crowded with rubble. And I don't know if you've ever been hill walking and walked across a rock field, and that is so uncomfortable, that's exactly what it was like. So. Come with the next slide. This is his project. You see the thick line? You can see the dotted line with the, with the shape of Jerusalem there that exists. And that's where he wanted to build a wall. So it was quite some project that he had in mind. You know, now, translate it across to our situation now. Here we are, Beacon Loft Baptist Church. You know, it's, it's had quite a big influence in a lot of time. But actually, it's not so much the firm line nowadays, it's a dotted line. And we've got so much area that we've covered and we're known, okay, and we have a good reputation. But actually, the wall that we're going to build is be something like that. So it's, it's a big vision, isn't it? But God wants us to have a big vision because, you see, as I was saying earlier, nothing for him is impossible. Okay, we can switch that off now, that's all right. Now, also last week, we looked at the historical uh, setting. We looked at the ethnic cleansing the behaviour of the Babylonians and how they would take particularly the young people or anyone with any promise into captivity. They would rename them, retrain them, but they scattered them across the kingdom so there was no chance that they could regroup. So they could never be an influence against them. And of course the Assyrians took over uh, from the Babylonians and they allowed people to go back. And then we, we heard that returning home from a foreign land was all the exiles generations later were allowed to return home on condition now they were allowed to worship um, they were allowed to practice their own religion but uh, on the condition that in their area there would be a vassal ruler that would mean a ruler who was friendly to the Assyrians who was actually ruled by them but also the men would be liable to call up if there was going to be a war okay so that were the conditions so all these people went back now generations of of these young people came back um, but all their forebears who had been taken into captivity were long since dead. So all they had in their minds were the pictures and the stories of Zion. Okay? And it was a romantic picture. You know what it's like? You know, we, we talk about the past and how glorious it was. But actually, I mean, I, the amount of times I've spoken to people, I've what, what a good time the Blitz was. You know, it was a terrible time, but I was a good, a blitz spirit. We stuck together and people valued each other. But it was just awful because they were hungry. Now, on arrival, when they've come back, they find huge mounds of rubble, but they're not deterred. They stuck to their vision initially, and they made efforts, first of all, to rebuild the temple. But it was taking so long, and the project was so big, and you can imagine them being overwhelmed, that they gave up, and instead they focused on making themselves comfortable. Now, 90 <laughs> years later, um, you know, Nehemiah comes into this. And there must have been some regret for these people. You know, the if only, if only, if only things were like they'd imagined them to be. If only it had been like the stories that have been passed down to us. 
See, this was their center. This was their homeland. This was their heritage. But they couldn't see the promise for the rubble. The tables had been turned and now instead of feeling that they were home, they felt now that they were exiles because actually they were born and brought up in different parts of the Babylonian Empire and suddenly they're coming back and this is a foreign land. And they're so different from the people who are punished and then repentant when they've been conquered and taken into captivity. In actual fact, let me read something to you. Psalm 137, this was when they were taken into captivity. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And there on the poplars we hung our harps. No singing, please. Right. For there, our, for there our captors asked for our songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while we're in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you. If I don't consider Jerusalem as my highest joy. Incredible. That's where they'd been. They, they determined at that point when they were being taken into captivity, they were going to remember their heritage and they were going to pass it on. They'd made their mistakes. You see, they realized too late the great God that they had. They realized too late his provision and the reputation that they had as a people of joy because they'd taken it all for granted. And it hadn't occurred to them to maintain a spiritual life, a meaningful worship as a nation. But you see, this is the standard behaviour of those who take so much for granted. And I'll tell you what, in the Christian church is exactly the same. And we bemoan the fact that some of our great buildings, the great preaching centres, lie empty now. And we wonder what's happened. And so often we romanticise about the past... But we realise that they're missed opportunities. You know, I can remember going to a church, asked a preacher at a church, and they were looking for a minister. And they were so hung up on a minister, not the one who just left, but the one who 20 years before had seen some success in his ministry. If success is a good word, I don't think it's a good word. But And when I arrived in the morning... One of the deacons came out of the prayer meeting. I thought I was going to the prayer meeting. He says, oh, no, we're not going in there. And he took me on a tour of the buildings. And he told me how great the place had once been under this preacher 20 years ago. Now, what a start. I was just a guest preacher. Now, clearly, I was never going to make the grade. But that wasn't the point. The point was they were so stuck in their past that even their present minister who had just left had had enough. And how often we do that. We get stuck, don't we? And we forget, for example, listen to this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is it does not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as he is you forever got to keep that in your sight if you lose that then you lose everything and this is where the people were for those returning to jerusalem where could they go obviously they couldn't go back the way they couldn't see any way forward because all they were faced with these piles of rubble well we just have to make the best of a bad job there's your blitz spirit and when Nehemiah to returns to the city with all his equipment and his men and his soldiers, they see him riding in. And they would have been curious, wouldn't they? But I tell you what, people probably would have been thinking, oh, another Persian official riding through. That's not going to cause much of a stir, is it? Nehemiah's emotions, I think from, from his point of view, his emotions would be running high as well. He's another one. He's not been back yet. He's heard stories. He's heard how bad it is. And he's persuaded the king because he's upset. He wants to go back and do something about it. And like those that returned, he had this image in his mind. And after seeing God at work and answering his prayer, having stepped out boldly in the strength of God, having asked the king to provide letters to the officials and the lands he had passed through, all the materials. And you know, he'd taken his life in his hands already because to speak to a Persian king, let alone to pull a face in his presence, meant death, actually. Oh, the things he was going to do for God. Have you been there? Oh, I'm really going to do it for God. Just you wait and see. 
We'll be on our way in no time. And imagine him waxing eloquent to those who was travelling, not talking about his plans, but talking about just how great God is. Talking about, do you, uh, do you know? Do you know? Here I was in the presence of the king, and you can imagine the, the cavalry officer saying, yeah, here he goes again, you know. And he said, and you know what? And, and you never guess what happened. There I was, and I, I well, I looked sad, you know, and, and he spoke to me. Did he? Yeah, yeah, he spoke. And do you know what? He asked me what I wanted to do. And I'm sure he was saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as it went on and on and on, witnessing to the faithfulness of God, talking of promise, and then in the distance, he says, oh, there, there's Jerusalem, we're coming up to it now. And he looks in the distance, and he's looking for all sorts of things in his picture in his head, and all he sees is piles of rubble. He'd known the city would be damaged. He knew all of that, but this... And there was no one living within the walls either. See, what Nehemiah had, and I think we have to have as well, is firstly an encounter with reality. On arrival, the camp is set up, a meal's cooked, Nehemiah probably wonders what possessed him to even think the way that he did. You know the way that sometimes you pray for things, and then you wonder why you bother praying in the first place. Have you ever been there? And there's this resolve, isn't there? Well... I've got to do more than make do here. And like any visionary, he decides to assess the situation and see the potential of what could one day be. Do you know, about 350 years ago, the first travellers set northeast to the coast of America. When they arrived, they established a town site in the first year. The next year, they elected a town government. The third year, the town government planned to build a road five miles westward. That was the pioneering spirit. We're going to go west and explore the country. In the fourth year, the people tried to impeach their town government because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a, ro a roadway five miles westward into the wilderness. Who needs to go there anyway? You see the picture? Here we have a people of vision who saw 3,000 miles across a, an ocean <laughs> to overcome great hardships to get there, but in just a few years, they weren't even able to see five miles out of their town. And that's exactly where the church is. That's exactly where the people of Jerusalem were. All our ideas, all our drive, all our desires. But you see, with a clear vision of what we can become in Christ, no ocean is too difficult or too great. And without it, without vision, we rarely move out with that boundary. But then, you know, we, have, we place limits on our prayers. And I'm, I'm sure I've told you this story. I'm going to tell you again. It cracks me up every time. The story of the minister and his, his cat. Not, not the minister's cat, but it, this, this minister had a cat and... This cat was forever running out of the front garden and his wife was really getting anxious. And this cat climbed up a sapling. And, uh, of course, he couldn't climb the sapling. And you know what saplings like? They bend easy. So he thought, right, I'll tell you what I'll do. So he got a bit of string high up and he tried to pull it, but he couldn't get it down low enough. So he thought, oh, I don't know. No, I did. So what he did, he got his car and he tied it to the bumper and he moved it forward. See, and the, the tree was coming over like this. And he got out of the car and he went to reach for it and the rope snapped. And it, ping, and the cat flew. And he spent an hour and a half looking for this cat, and he couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, wow. So he committed its way to the Lord and said, look, I didn't do it on purpose, you know, and went home and told, him his, told his wife his cat was lost. A few days later, he was at the supermarket, and there was one of the church members. Um, she was uh, pushing a trolley out. And she had loads of cat food in the trolley. And um, he knew that she didn't particularly like cats. So he said, uh, son, you, you, you'd be buying cat food? He says, oh, she said, oh, my daughter. She said, I should, I should watch what I say, you know. She said, why? He said, well, she's been on at me about having a cat for weeks and weeks. I mean, you know what they're like? He said, yeah. So I told her to go and sit in the garden and pray about it. <laughs> so there she was, sitting in the garden, praying about a cat. And suddenly one landed from the sky. So I said, it's from the Lord, so we've got to keep it. <laughs> How? Do you remember what we said? Nothing is impossible with God. But you know, rather than marching straight into the people and telling the people of Jerusalem, well, I'm Nehemiah, and this is what I plan to do. And Nehemiah's very astute. And what he does is he, sit, he surveys the situation for himself. And what he had to bear in mind, you see, was that it was a, a diplomatic situation that could easily become inflamed. And if he wasn't careful, he could easily overwhelm the people before gaining their confidence in the plan that God had in mind. 
And I think this is a lovely picture of grace. You see, God sends into the situation someone who will help them gain perspective, who will inspire confidence, who, who will instill a little bit of a desire in them to establish their identity and so redis rediscover what it means to be the people <laughs> of God in a centrifugal sense and a centripetal sense. And what I mean by that is that a centripetal means something that draws people in and centrifugal means that which sends the message out. That's where he's got to get them to. But he's not going to get it to by dictating to them. They've had that all their days. To go to the people without preparation, you see, will clearly have been a mistake. And so his tour at night is away from curious eyes. There was a perspective gaining exercise for him. You see, he was going to put forward some definite proposals. But if he was going to do that, then he had to be able to show them that he understood the real difficulties that were there. And that the complexities of the situation were there too. And that he saw that they had responsibilities. But then to help them to realise those same responsibilities in the bigger picture, seeing the purpose in it all. And so teaching them to ask the why questions. Now a major difficulty for the people until now was the influence of the powerful and the negative. Now in particular, there was a real fear attached to three men. And these men were Sambala, Tobiah and Geshe, and we're going to hear a lot about them. All of these men had substantial power and influence, and physically they were able to attack Jerusalem at any time. So the people felt constantly under threat. So they were towing the line. Life wasn't much different for them than it had been under the Babylonians. In a practical sense, there was much there to learn. And for believers, there's much to learn. There's a, a need for us to be earthed so that we demonstrate a spirituality that's relevant and which speaks into everyday life real events. And one of the big mistakes for the Christian church, as I see it, is that over the years, we've separated ourselves so far from the world that we live in so that those on the outside perceive religious belief and faith as something like a mode of behaviour rather than a form of life that is both belief and behaviour. Now, although for the most part, in Jerusalem, the walls were rubble, the boundaries of the city were actually clearly defined. Well, we've seen that. It's in dots, isn't it? It's easy. Okay. No one was able to say that they couldn't tell the difference between living within the walls and outside the walls. Now, spiritually, we can see an application there, can't we? Today, in our modern world, with the boundaries of that which is not acceptable, and which is acceptable, all of them have been buried under so much rubble of double standards that people are totally confused now. And particularly young people are totally confused. What does the Bible teach? What does the church really believe? Just what are the boundaries? And we have to decide what we want. Either we expect the teaching of the Bible through the church to influence the world, or we expect the world to dictate Christian teaching in the church. And which one is it going to be? And this is exactly the situation of Israel in the text. Lost and bewildered as far as their relationship with God went. And this is Nehemiah's role, although I don't think he really understood that at the time. He was there not just to inspire confidence in these people. Nehemiah was there to put God back on the agenda. Moving him to say, so what if the walls are down? So what if things are not the way we imagine them to be? So what if things haven't worked out the way we expected them? What does God want? What does God require of us now? What does it mean to be the people of God? See, one of the great gospel stories for me is the, uh, the story when Jesus got in a boat and sailed across the lake of Galilee into a place called Gadara, or the Gerasenes. The boat's pulled ashore and just a short distance from the shore is a cemetery. And just as he puts his foot on the shore, this man, raving man, comes running out the right graveyard, screaming at him. And he's terrifying this man. He's mentally deranged. He lives in a cemetery. He's always self-harming. He's got cuts and bruises all over his body. And, you know, the local people are that terrified of him, they chain him up. But he always finds a way to break free. And he terrorises everyone. And now he comes charging at Jesus, shouting, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Do you want to torture me? 
And this dramatic encounter takes place in which Jesus confronts the arranged personality and he cuts straight to the quick and he casts the demons out of him. And then the man finds himself healed and calm and peaceful and in his right mind. But my favourite bit of the story is this bit. As Jesus was getting into the boat to leave, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus didn't let him, but he said, look, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. You see, we're so used to stories, aren't we, of people leaving their homes and their families to follow Jesus. We're so used to the stories of people called out of the ordinary, out of the everyday. Think of Peter and the disciples around Jesus at the time. You can leave your fishing business and be a fisher of men. Well, here in Jerusalem, what we actually see with these people is the call in reverse. God does call some people out of the ordinary, but for most Christians, spirituality is not about leaving the ordinary. It's about recognising how extraordinary the ordinary is. It's about living out Jesus' character in the midst of the ordinariness of everyday life. It's about seeing that being a mother or a foreman or a volunteer worker is an environment for living out your faith. It's recognising that the struggle to balance a family budget and suffering through sleepless nights with sick kids is where your faith hits the road. It's knowing that while God sometimes does amazing miracles of healing, it's just as awesome to experience God's comfort as you struggle with everyday life. Nehemiah, you see, was being a really good leader. Look at verse 17 and 18. He says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. And I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, right, let's start rebuilding. And so they began this good work together. I think it's great. Do you see the, you see the pattern there? He reports to them and he appeals to them. And then he gives them this rationale. And he tells them, look, God is gracious and has worked through the king. And this means your fears are dealt with. You haven't got to worry about reprisals here. We're doing this with permission. And the people's response is what? Let's start building then. And then the trouble began. They thought they were in trouble, but then it began. You see, they had an encounter with reality. And secondly, and there will only be one more heading today, the encounter with the enemy. Look at verse 19 and 20. <coughs> but when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What's this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now, Nehemiah was met just with a wall of words. These three were concerned that anyone should ever consider coming to help the people. And you can actually see that in verse 10. If you go back in the book of Ezra, you can see exactly what happened and how they had a fear that if Jerusalem ever became a force again, it could cause trouble in the empire. Now, we don't know why this should be. Maybe it was a racial attack, I don't know. Maybe the stories of long ago and how powerful the nation under the leadership of their God had been. There's a smell of fear about the whole thing. And you know, like a bunch of bullies, they make a lot of noise and they're happy to posture in a group, aren't they? You ever encounter bullies? I remember working in a factory as a youngster. I just remember that. And I remember they told me, you will join the union. No, I was 16, 17. I didn't have a clue what a union was, let alone how to spell it. Of course, the worst thing they could have ever done to me was tell me that I had to do something. So I said, I won't have to do anything. But I didn't realise, I understand now, it was a closed shop. I was beaten, I was chased. It was just an awful time. But you know, when I got them individually, they were terrified. Verse 20 says that they had no part or share in Jerusalem because they were rooted in different cultures. You know, the first thing they did was ridicule him. If only they knew, you know, if only they'd taken the trouble to find out that Nehemiah had written authority from the king but the interesting thing, have you noted, 
It doesn't come to an answer to their level. It doesn't wave his scroll in their face and say, by the way, have you read that? He doesn't do that. What he does, he states his real authority. Look at this. He says, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. That's my real authority here. It's not about the king. It's not about you. It's not about politics. This is about me following God. You know, we meet the Sambalats, the Tobias and the Geshems every time we pick up a newspaper, a magazine or switch on our telly. They're the symbols and the moulders of the and the opinion makers who make up their ideas and project them onto the masses through media. And we should never underestimate the power of the media. The power of the media blurs our thinking in terms of defining the boundaries. And isn't it amazing how we see these so-called experts on TV or hear them on the radio and they have all the authority about them and they get get the impression, they give the impression that we really should listen to them because after all they're educated people, they've had a successful career in all they do. Maybe we should really listen to what they're saying. Oh, that's interesting, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to us believing what the Bible says about the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God? Before this was written, Nehemiah knew it. And by let, letting these me, three men know that God was in control, he gave them the message loud and clear that they had no share in what God was doing because God had not even entered their thinking. But by standing our ground, life can become costly as we stand on principles and values and standards that oppose that which has become normal in our society. That's where the boundaries are. And again, we need to realise that although the physical focus at this moment in time was the city of Jerusalem, this is not about real estate. It was never intended to be. Jerusalem, in context here, is about the spiritual identity of the people. It was the place where the temple, the centre of worship is. And historically, this is where the pilgrims travelled to. And these three, Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem, they don't worship God. They've got no desire to. And so no part of that activity or life of the people of God actually belongs to them. There was a way for them to come in, but they weren't interested. And so the questions have to be asked of us. Why does all our wisdom and all our opinions, why do they, why do they come from other people? And what is it that makes us believe the box in the corner of the room rather than take account of what God has already said to us. We see these folks, you know, producing books, appearing on talk shows with all manner of philosophies of life, and, and they say that as working, and we could be excused from asking, is there an answer from heaven for our society today? We need to be answering that question. And these folk living around the ruins of the city of God were probably wondering exactly the same thing. But notice something else, how these three, these three Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem, just attack the efforts to rebuild even before the work has begun. There's no physical attack, they just use these powerful weapons of ridicule and laughter. If we don't do what others do, if we don't go where others go, if we don't think like others think, then the world will mock us and laugh at us. And you know, there's nothing more humiliating, is there, when someone laughs at you and you don't know what they're laughing at. See, the standards we live by, the values that we hold, all based on giving God his place. You see, these are fundamental if we're going to grow spiritually to rebuild the crumbling walls and growing grace. The problem with the Sambalats and the Tobias and Geshems of this world is that they will use convincing arguments and persuasion so that we'll take on board compromising attitudes and behaviour in an attempt to bring about some kind of balance. And we'll dress it up with all these words. And yet all we do is start on this slippery slope of confusion so that, for instance, the Ten Commandments become the Ten Amendments. As we allow ourselves to follow the pattern of thought and we and our children allow ourselves to learn a different set of rules and standards and so we become captive to the lie of the enemy and miss the promise of God that is all around us. The enemy has no share in our future. This is our heritage. So let's get on with building, shall we? And we continue next week. Let's pray together, shall we?
We thank you, Lord, that you meet us exactly where we are, that you grant us a confidence and a willingness to serve. And even in those impossible times, we thank you that you grant us the faith to live as we should. So help us this day to remember that we don't necessarily have to just compromise with the world that we live in, that we can have values and standards, and that we can have an opinion, that we can be a real and relevant people. Make us, we pray, a people who really hold on to your love, who reflect your love in the world in which we live. And we ask that that might affect many others so they may come to know you as their saviour too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our final hymn, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. Thank you.